Hello, Maverick fans. Welcome to another edition of the Mavs Podcast. I'm Jason. And I am John. We have some more hockey to talk about. So what did you think on Friday night? I I thought we played really good on Friday, actually. Okay. Uh, by far, probably one of the better Fridays I've seen us play. I know this team talks about, and we've talked about, their woes lately of not being able to win a Friday game. Uh, I thought they really came out, played their system. They didn't get frazzled when, uh, when that unassisted goal came about and we were down one nothing, you know, really early in the first period. I kind of worried right then that, you know, things would kind of get away from us, but we settled into it. We, we drove play. I think we outshot them significantly in the first period of Friday's game. And they were, there was a lot of quality opportunities. I think that's something we don't really touch on a whole lot, but like there's a difference between, you know, a game where you have 50 shots on goal and they're all from the perimeter versus a game where you have, you know, 20 shots on goal and they're all from the slot. Like that's, that's an entirely different analysis, but you know, we had high danger chances and it just seemed like we didn't really have the puck luck. And, you know, we get a late goal in the power play on Friday. And that I think at least for me kind of eased my concern. I was like, you know, we're in this, we're playing well, we're tied, we're going into the second we're on the road. We're playing a, you know, a really quality road game. I just, it just sucks that it, it ended up the way it did on Friday. And, you know, we came out in that second period and just started chasing and some bounces didn't go our way. And we ended up down four one. Yeah. Two of North Dakota's goals came uh, when Mark Senden came out of the box on Friday nights. Um <laughs> And it was that the first North Dakota goal that you're talking to was basically a three on one. Um, if you look at us and I took some notes on this, that's why I'm, I'm looking down here on my phone, but we had two good opportunities in the first 10 minutes of the second. Uh, and, that, and that's really, I think what you were talking about was some of the good quality shots. You know, a lot of people talk about out shooting an opponent. Um, and, and a lot of times it's not significant if you out shoot them by five or six shots. I think we outshot them overall in the game 27 to 20. Uh, but it's the, it's really those good quality opportunities that that as a fan you notice because because you can outshoot you know a, a team thirty four to seventeen but some of those shots are you know are basically uh, taken with the equivalent of a nine iron and put up and uh, they hit the net behind the goaltender so you have those moments it was one of those games where they did have opportunities ultimately their Friday night woes continued and it was just kind of frustrating to see. Uh, you don't like to, you don't like to have that, you know, it was tied up after the, after the uh, first period, but it was really the second period that belonged to North Dakota and, uh, and ultimately we couldn't recover. So going into Saturday night, obviously I picked a North Dakota sweep, but how did you feel going into that game? I wasn't sure. Uh, that we would be able to uh, recover and get it going. And, and honestly, during most of the game, I thought we played well. And ultimately, I think it was the, it was the freshman, Davis Pennington, who hadn't played on Friday night, who comes into the game. And he gets a goal, 543 into the third period. He gets that goal, and it's 2-1 to one at that point. And that really seemed to change the fortunes for our team. Suddenly, it felt like the wind was at their back. They had momentum, and they started playing much better hockey. Yeah, going into the third, I know. I would expect at least the, the coach probably in the locker room said something to the effect of, you know, we're, we're down to going into the third divide, the divide the period up. You look at it into three segments, that first five minutes, the next 10 and the last five, you know, if you can put a goal together in the first five and the second 10, you know, that's a, that's a recipe for getting back into a game where you're down. Right. And that's, that's what we did. You know, we got that first goal pretty much in the first five. I mean, slightly out of it, but, you know, really close to it. They pushed pretty well coming out, and I think that's what we kind of needed to see. I mean, going into the night, I was I was hopeful that we'd come out the way that we came out Friday and we'd have just some better luck with some pucks and might be able to get, you know, get that, that lead and have that momentum. Um, when we didn't have it in the second, I still thought like we're only down one, you know, 
we'll be okay. The power plays just, I mean, just killed us. That goal, I think, really took the wind out of their sails. I, it seemed like a different team in that like second half of the second period. So I was actually kind of concerned going into the third lane. Are they just going to pack it in or not? I was concerned going into that third period, certainly being down two to right. nothing. And then, like you said, it's that momentum in hockey is a, it's a weird thing because when you have it, like you ride it as long as you can, when you don't have it, it seems like it's the one thing you can never seem to get. Like it's really hard to snatch momentum, especially late in the game. Uh, and you could just tell the energy on the team, like, the drop of the puck after Pennington's goal. And I was like, it's a different team. Yep. They, they were hard on the pucks. They were, they were after some of the stuff. They were winning some of the battles they were losing early. We still struggle in the face-off circle, but I mean, it just seemed like we were finding ways to make a play instead of finding ways to lose out on things. Right. And we've talked about that with, you know, the quality talents, like you look at North Dakota and, and this is an, you know, an odd situation for North Dakota. North Dakota is usually a team where, you know, we win games we're supposed to win, you know, and up to nothing against Omaha, you're supposed to win. So it's, it should be a, it should be a performance boost. It should be a, a ego boost for our guys, right? Like you just went to North Dakota, went into the third period down to nothing and found a way to claw back and win. Like, that shows that you can hang with them. You can skate with them. You can perform at that level. Uh, you just have to make a decision to do so. Yeah, I completely agree with that. It was good to get that positive momentum coming out of that game. And it was good to get the two conference points because that at least keeps us in the conversation. Turning to our player of the week, I'll tell you who I'm going to go with. I am going with Davis Pennington, who USCHO referred to as Pennington Davis this week on their website. Uh, <laughs> Brent Bean pointed that out on Twitter. So I thought that was kind of interesting, but his goal five minutes, 43 seconds into the third was key for UNO getting back into that game and salvaging something out of this series. I've, I've been impressed by him this season and uh, maybe not a statistical giant like some of the other guys, but his participation was uh, important on Saturday night. And it was good to see him in the game. Well, I really like the setup by Weiss on that play. I really think that his vision set that up and it just a really good finish by Pennington. That was, that was a good play. I'm going to go with one of your popular picks and say Brandon Scanlon. He continues to be a force on the back end. Uh, Oddly enough, he's kind of, it seems at least from watching that he's kind of taken charge of that, that blue line, which was a role that I really thought Tyconic would would take over and then kind of be that veteran presence and stability and stuff on the blue line. But this whole season, our defense has really relied on, on Brandon Scanlon. And it's, uh, it's fun to watch him. He's a good skater. He's got some good edges. Uh, you know, he's, he's been obviously working on his vision his outlets and to see some of that stuff kind of start to work and, and some of those passes come in and, uh, hopefully he starts taking more of those bombs from the point on the power play and uh, he'll get he'll get some more goals and then plenty of more assists if he starts you know letting those rip more on that power play yeah he's a fantastic player you know he's one of my favorite players I'm I like I mentioned to you via text earlier today I'm I'm a little worried because uh, anytime you have a talented defenseman like that who's got the size who's got the wingspan who hasn't been drafted I get a little worried that uh, that some pro teams and some pro scouts are going to have him go pro early. I don't want to put any ideas in his head, but uh, I remember when he was recruited, looking at some of the the highlight reel footage of him from the Brooks Bandits and uh, and uh, just a tremendous player. And he's been really important for us. And like you said, it is kind of a surprise because you have a veteran player like Tyconic who transferred in from North Dakota and to see a guy like uh, like Brandon Scanlon really kind of take control of uh, the D units. And uh, a lot of that great offensive zone play that we have is, uh, it's fantastic. So turning to our shootout segment, Jason and I are going to tackle a topic this week that we're not necessarily excited about, but a lot of fans talk about <laughs> this time of we, year. Yeah. Fire up the trolls in the comments. Cause <laughs> this is the, this is what they keep asking for. Because they all want to berate us about they, what they, we think. So here we go. 
Yeah, they, they want to know, look, UNO currently sits at 17 wins right now. And at this point, and with that many wins, people are talking NCAA tournaments. I know a lot of people have had some ideas online. Some of them are, are close to being accurate. Some of them really aren't close to being accurate. Um, the pairwise ranking system, for those who aren't familiar with it, just so people understand, this is not like college football or college basketball where you have these media polls that people look at and there's a lot of human element that goes into determining what bowl games teams play in uh, in college football or, or whether they're in the 14 playoff. It's not like college basketball where the NCAA tournament, there's a lot of human element in there. Sometimes it seems like they do things to make it interesting for TV. With college hockey, the pairwise ranking system that you'll find on USCHO approximates the formula that the NCAA uses. So you don't have a bunch of guys in cigar-filled rooms determining the teams. So Jason has run some numbers to, you know, qualify what we're talking about here and for people who aren't completely familiar with it the easy answer to how we get into the tournament is go always going to be win your conference because every conference winner automatic bid because of that if you're assuming that we don't win the nchc tournament and we don't have the automatic bid uh after that you always have to assume that there's a team that wins the conference because there's a couple conferences out there where the winner of their conference is literally going to be the only team in their conference that gets in. And they're probably outside of the top 16 in the pairwise. You know, usually it's one most commonly. Uh, there have been years that it's been, I, I remember one year where it was four. Uh, so it could be a, a significant number if you have a lot of upsets in those conference tournaments. Uh, that could, could change things. But realistically, I was looking at it saying, if we're going to make it as an at-large bid, we have to be at least 14. Um, and that yeah. gives you two spots for some of those lesser conferences to get their um, automatic bid in at that point in time. And, you know, that's where, that's where the strength of our out-of-conference schedule comes in. Uh, that's where a lot of the, the play in this, too, like, uh, the other thing that, that I did when I did this is I assumed that for the rest of the season, the higher seed wins every time, right? And there's going to be upsets in college hockey, and that's going to change the math slightly. Uh, so there's, there's not a, a dead set, even, you know, with eight games left in the season, like, there's not a dead set path for us to get there. But realistically, if we want an at-large bid, at bid, there's a couple things that need to happen. One, we have to sweep Miami at Miami. We have to win two road games, including a Friday game, which we know we have trouble doing uh, on the road this weekend. And I mean, if we don't do that, I don't know that there's a, I mean, you're going to end up in a situation where you basically have to win out to get in, or you got to win your conference championship. Because if we can't sweep Miami uh, with where they are in the standings of the pairwise, we're always going to have a problem. After that, it becomes a best of six kind of series. Um, we can't we can't lose two to any of those those teams that you mentioned: Denver, St. Cloud, North Dakota. We have to at least split with them. And in my math, it's going to take one more win in there somewhere. So we either have to sweep at home St. Cloud, North Dakota, or Denver, one of them. And then split the other two. So that's a pretty tall order when you consider the the caliber of teams that we're playing there. When you look at those teams, you know, Denver's playing probably some of the best hockey in NCAA right now. If it wasn't for the start of their season, I'm willing to bet that they'd be an odds on favorite number one. They're just they are on top of everything right now. Um, you know, North Dakota is the team that's kind of sliding of all of those. St. Cloud had a tough two games out. Uh, in Denver, had a lead and lost it, and then got shut out on a Saturday. So, you know, they might be the easiest opportunity for us to steal those two wins out of, but it's still, it's St. Cloud, and they're fighting with Duluth for a chance at, you know, home, uh, ice advantage in, in that 
first round of the NCHC playoffs. So these are, it's going to be tough. And what you're talking about is absolutely right. Uh, for those who don't know, Atlantic hockey is typically the team that will, uh, will have their auto bid team be a team that is not ranked in the top 16 teams of the pairwise. Um, and then other conferences, you know, that you'll, you'll often see upsets are the ECAC, which includes a lot of the Ivy League schools and the newfangled CCHA, which used to be the WCHA and even Hockey East. You know, I, I never count out Boston College or Boston University, even though they might not be in the top 16 teams in the pairwise. Those are two teams when you start to get into the, the Hockey East tournament that they can uh, they can upset some higher ranked teams. So you just never know. And like Jason said, if you want to feel at all comfortable, 14th place is kind of where you need to be. And we talk about this every year. You know, NCAA tournament bids are won in, you know, October and November. I know uh, a lot of people don't think that, but yeah, interesting stuff. Uh, it'll be interesting to follow as, as the, as the games dwindle and things start to narrow a little bit, we'll have an even better picture. Cause like you said, it's the, the tendency is to have UNO upsetting teams, but have all the other teams in college hockey that are supposed to win winning. And that's not necessarily a realistic scenario. So you just kind of try to do the best you can, but, uh, turning to that next series at Miami, we should be able to go into Oxford, Ohio and sweep the Miami Red Hawks. But you know as well as I do, Jason, that we just don't know if Friday Night Mavs are going to show up. You know, our first conference game of the season against Miami, we ended up losing that game. I feel like we should get a sweep. I don't know what you're thinking. I'm hoping that the uh, positive outcome coming back down from two to nothing on Saturday night at North Dakota will help propel the team. They know they can do it. We have the talent to beat these guys. We have the talent to beat most of the teams that we play. I'm going to be optimistic this week. I'm going to say that we go into Oxford and sweep because we should sweep at Miami. I'm with you. Like I'm, I think we should sweep. Uh, I know we've split before and all of that you just talked about, but you know, at this point in time, if this team really wants to make a run at it and have a chance, they've got to step up and they have to step up now. So I'm going to predict the sweep as well. And I will alert our listeners. This will probably change by the time the podcast gets posted. Um, but I had the schedule up on CHN and College Hockey News has us playing at 11 p.m. on Thursday. So... Unless they're changing something and haven't announced it, CHN is wrong, and we do have a Friday-Saturday series, not a Thursday-Saturday series. Yes, we do have a Friday-Saturday series, according to uh, Miami's website, and that Friday game is on CBS Sports Network. I'm trying to think, how do we normally do in games that are, on, uh, that are nationally televised, Jason? Not good. Okay. <laughs> okay, well, that's the Friday night game, so... Uh... <laughs> Well, there's two strikes against us. Maybe we should go back and rethink our picks. I'm going to go back and say we split. <laughs> I'm sticking with the uh, sweep. Jason's going to stick with the sweep. And we'll just see how it goes. But uh, we'll, uh, we'll part with our, uh, our normal uh, send-off and just say, go Mavs. Go Mavs.